This is the second and final lecture on the book of Ephesians, and we've seen that there are six chapters in this book, and it's about the church. Chapter 1, the church is likened to the body of Christ, and secondly, to the temple. Thirdly, the church is likened to a mystery. And now in chapter 4, the church is likened unto a new man. Uh, Paul begins by saying, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation to which you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So this man now, Paul speaks of the new man and his position, chapter 4, verses 4 to 16, and then the new man and his disposition. And uh, my position is what I am in Christ. My disposition is how I act concerning that new relationship with Christ. Now notice the unity of my new position. Seven great stabilizers here. One body, and of course that's Christ's body, the church. One spirit. The Bible says test the spirits to see whether they be of God. But there's only one spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. One hope. And by the way, that is a noun hope and not a verb hope. A noun hope says, I have a hope. A noun hope says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's the noun hope. But a verb hope says, I hope to have. There's a tremendous difference between a noun and a verb hope. You ask some people, are you going to heaven? I hope to have a place up there. But Paul here has a noun hope, and one hope, and that's the hope, of course, the blessed hope, and actually it's called the glorious hope, a lively hope, a firm hope, an eternal hope, a better hope. And that's the hope, uh, actually the assurance, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or if we're alive when Jesus comes to be caught up in the air and to meet Christ without dying. That's the hope of the gospel. One hope and then one faith. It's often called the faith. Uh, people speak of having a sincere faith. And uh, what faith do you belong to? Sometimes people will ask. There's only one true faith. And often that's used with a definite article. For example, in 1 Timothy, Paul says that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. And there's only one faith. And we are to contend, Jude said, for the faith that was once for all, in the Greek it says, delivered unto the saints. One body, one spirit. These are the stabilizers now of this new man, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, I'm a strong Baptist, but very frankly, this does not speak of water baptism here in chapter 4. This speaks of spirit baptism, where we are baptized into the body of Christ. To answer the question, do you have to be baptized to be saved? You certainly do, but it is not H2O baptism. It is spirit baptism into the body of Christ. One baptism and one God the Father. These are the seven great stabilizers of the new man and his position. And then the, that's the unity of his new position. Now the unifier of his new position and Jesus Christ himself, in verse 7, 
but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. These next few verses are uh, somewhat difficult, at least they have been uh, made difficult, I think, by the commentators, and there's a lot of uh, weird uh, interpretations uh, but many Bible believers think that when Paul wrote these uh, scriptures, uh, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, and especially 8 and 9, uh, that he was speaking about an event that took place after the death of Jesus when he entered into the safe compartment of Hades in the heart of the earth called Abraham's bosom and paradise, and depopulated that safe compartment and laid a, uh, made a triumphal entry, led a triumphal entry into the very heavenlies. And then uh, from that vantage point, he then gave gifts, the 18 gifts of the Spirit, to men, uh, and he gave them to the Holy Spirit to give to men. Let's read these verses. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is he? Uh, actually, that should be who is he, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. I believe that took place between Friday and Sunday. He that descended is the same that ascended up, far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, what did he do when he ascended? He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. And so here are four or five of the gifts that are listed. I believe there are some 18 gifts and uh, some of them are mentioned here in Ephesians 4, some are mentioned in Romans 12, and others are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, that's the, uh, the gifts. What about the goal? Well, we're told, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. I think spiritual maturity is probably the greatest single virtue of the Christian faith. The old proverb says, All consistency thou art a virtue. And that's certainly true with spiritual maturity. You know, God doesn't demand that someone be eloquent or brilliant or handsome or rich or strong or famous, but he does require them to be mature if he's going to use them. And I see this perhaps as the, one of the greatest things needed in the life of believers today. I think we have a fine group of students in the Thomas Road Bible Institute. But every now and then, I have to call one of these students in, not basically because they're cheating, uh, not because they're certainly out committing immorality. Uh, I've never had to call a student in because he got drunk. Of course, if we find he's drinking or smoking, he's out of school automatically. But, but I do on occasion... Uh, before they graduate, I feel compelled to call some in and tell them uh, that they need this spiritual maturity. Often I'm asked by a student, uh, Dean Wilmington, I'm 30 years of age and I feel called to preach and I've had some background in business world and I'm not sure I want to go back and attend four years of college and dissect frogs and biology for a while, but... Uh, but uh, I understand you have a two-year program. Now, uh, will this equip me, these two years, to preach the gospel? And I always have to say, that depends 100% upon you. You see, there's one thing that I cannot give a Christian, a student, and that's maturity. This maturity must come from the Lord Jesus. Now, I can help 
somewhat. But in two years, if the man is 30 years old at the time and he doesn't have that maturity, chances are he's not going to get it in the two years at Thomas Road. The Bible says here that one of the things that Jesus Christ desires, perhaps above other, every other thing, is that his church be composed of mature men and women. And this is the reason for the giving of the gifts till we all, Paul says, come in the unity of faith. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Some time ago I felt it necessary to talk to one of my staff members and I told him in love, I said, you know, I know that you want to do what God wants you to do. He's having some real problems with his family at the time, his wife, and, and I said that you've done about everything that I think a man can do. But I said, you know, I, I sort of look upon you as Jesus, not that I'm comparing myself with Jesus, or, nor am I really comparing you with this rich young ruler that I'm going to tell you about. But, but in a sense, I think the analogy is correct, that I look upon you as Jesus may have looked upon or did look upon that rich young ruler who had so many things going for him. But Jesus said, this one thing thou lackest, one thing. Of course, it was the biggest thing. And I said to this young man, I said, I think the thing that you lack now, I said, is spiritual maturity. Your wife needs to see this maturity in you, and she doesn't see it. And I think that's 95% your problem. He felt it was his mother-in-law and father-in-law and, and uh, perhaps circumstances and the economy and bad luck and and uh, poor vi business uh, investment, but I said, I think spiritual maturity, that's the key thing. All right, now, we've looked at the new man and his position in Christ. Now, what about the new man and his disposition? My position is what I am in Christ. My disposition is how I react to what I am. And my position and disposition is sort of like my standing and my state. My standing never changes, but my state may change. My earthly condition from time to time, my standing in heaven never changes. But my disposition does, of course, and my state does. And Paul discusses the new man, his walk, his words, and his works. Notice what he says about his walk. We've already read these verses, uh, 1 to 3. He says, Walk worthy of the vocation to which ye are called. So we're to walk in this fivefold manner in lowliness, in meekness, in long suffering, in forbearing, and in unity. That's the walk. That's the positive walk of the child of God. We are to adopt the walk of the Savior and, negatively speaking, we are to avoid the walk of the sensual. Verses 17 to 19. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. So our walk is to be the walk of the Savior. Now what about our words? Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. That's one of the most important statements in the Bible. You know, you can speak the truth without love, and you can speak love without the truth. If you speak the truth without love, that's lifelessness. If you speak love without the truth, that's uselessness. And I think sometimes 
the fundamentalists, we fundamentalists, speak the truth, but not in love. And I think the liberals attempt to speak in love without the truth. But you need both. Speaking the truth in love. He goes on to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Someone has said that the believer ought to so live that he wouldn't be afraid to sell his talking parrot to the town gossip. All right, our walk and our words and now my works. What am I to do? I'm to put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and I'm to put on the new man. Notice verse 24. And that put ye on the new man. That's what this chapter is about. The church is likened to a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He's to control his tongue also. This is the part of his works. Wherefore, putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And he is to control his temper, not only his tongue, but his temper. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, Dale Moody, I think it was, that once remarked he wouldn't give a, a dime for a Christian without a temper. Uh, but he also wouldn't give a nickel for a believer who couldn't control his temper, you see. It's been said that a man is like a piece of steel in that both are useless, the man and the steel, when they, when they lose their temper. Then he is to stop stealing. Uh, notice uh, the scripture says that he was actually, and Dr. Kent suggests here, that he was actually stealing at this time, verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. And Kent, Dr. Kent suggests that he's not referring to past habits before they got saved, but he's actually referring to a petty thievery that was going on at that present time when he wrote these words. And uh, by the way, this goes on today. Uh, Christians still steal. Uh, they cheat on their income tax, and that's stealing on their insurance claims, that's stealing. Uh, they cheat on examinations, that's stealing. And every now and then a student will come and talk to me and say, you know, I cheated on that test. And, and I always say this uh, before I give a test. Uh, we are uh, now occupying the old sanctuary at Thomas Road and we're as crowded as we can possibly be, wall-to-wall -wall people. And uh, so when we have a test, it's so easy for a person, if you don't know the answer, to sort of look over. This fellow's uh, or gal's practically uh, seated uh, just right adjacent to you. And I always tell the students, hey, look, for the sake, the spiritual welfare of your neighbor, don't put him or her out of fellowship today. Don't cause them to grieve the Spirit of God by allowing them, maybe unintentionally, uh, to look upon your paper. So you, you watch out for their welfare by guarding your paper. You do them a favor in not allowing them to look off your paper. And Paul here says to do that. I remember uh, when I uh, pastored a church in Minneapolis, and I'd been there several months, and to my shame, I hadn't got my a driver's license uh, all fixed up and and uh, I mean had my driver's license didn't have my car license so I went down to fill out the papers and the that was in uh, I think October and the lady said uh, well how long have you been here I said well I actually I said I moved in May and she said well she said we don't check too much anyway you really should have been down here before now but she said uh, you know uh, you have to pay from the time that you first came. That's the law. And I said, all right. Then she said, let's see now. It's going to be quite a bit. We'll start figuring out from May on. 
And she said, I tell you what, nobody is going to check it out. Uh, why don't you, you can just put down, you just moved in October and it will be as much. And I said, okay. <laughs> I said, uh, oh, wait a minute, what is today? And she said, uh, it's Saturday. I said, oh, I can't do it. She said, well, why not? I said, I got to preach tomorrow. <laughs> and she was embarrassed and she said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were a minister. I said, well, that has nothing to do with it. I said, I might be a crooked minister, but I said, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and I said, I couldn't possibly preach a message on Sunday if I would steal from the state of Minnesota on Saturday. So here Paul says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to them that need it. All right, the final thing that he is to do, the new man in his disposition, he is to stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God. There are 31,173 verses in the Bible. How many times have you heard me say that? Probably 31,173 times, it seems. And I think the second strongest verse to prove eternal security is Ephesians 4, verse 30. The strongest verse, as I've said so often, is Romans 8, 30. The second strongest, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Paul says, grieve not. Literally, he says, stop grieving. They were doing it. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So these things the new man is to do concerning his disposition. The church, like a body, like a temple, like a mystery, like a new man. In chapter 5, the church is likened to a bride. This is one of the most beautiful chapters, I think, especially beginning with verse 22. Actually, beginning with verse 18, I suppose. It's all beautiful, but especially that passage from 18 on to, well, on to the remaining part of the chapter, 33, some of the most glorious words are written in the entire word of God. The church is likened to a bride. And you here you have 1 to 21, the bride, and then verses 22 to 33, uh, the bridegroom. What about the bride? Well, her duties as the church. What is she to do? She's to be separated. Paul says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. A bride is to separate herself from all other would-be suitors and lovers and cling to her bridegroom. She's to be separated. And she is to be serving. Ephesians 5, 16. Redeeming the time, buying it back, because the days are evil. And then she is to be searching. Searching, the Bible says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding, or searching out, what the will of the Lord is. The bride is to be concerned about the desires and the interests and the goals of the bridegroom. She's to be separated. She's to be serving. She's to be searching. And she is to be spirit-filled. Chapter 5, verse 18. This verse is terribly, I think, um, uh, how should I say this, uh, minimized. I think we emphasize the first part. We almost neglect the second part. Be not drunk with wine. We're in an excess. We always use that. But be filled with the Spirit. We don't use that. But you know, both these commands, be not filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, uh, receives the same emphasis by the Spirit of God. In other words, now, I doubt if you'll believe me when I say this, and it's hard for me to believe it myself, but it, I, you read the Word of God, it's certainly true. Apparently... It is as much sin not to be filled with the Spirit of God as it is to be filled with wine. Nobody would look at it that way, though. 
But that's what the Bible says. What would you think of your pastor, you that are lay people and Sunday school teachers in a local church, is uh, if uh, next Sunday morning uh, the pastor wobbled out on stage and you thought at first the poor fellow was having a heart attack. And uh, yet, so you went up to help him and then you uh, got a whiff of his breath and it uh, about knocked you down and you thought, my soul, uh, that man has been drinking. Why, the man is filled with wine. What would you do? Well, I'll tell you what you would do. Uh, you would uh, probably uh, report this to the deacons immediately or to the congregation. There'd be a meeting. And I suppose before he sobered up, he'd be out of a job and rightly so. But what if you found that your pastor had not prayed during that week, or let me talk to you as a pastor now, pastors. What about the times we enter the pulpit staggering in the spirit, if not in the body? By that I mean that our souls are empty and resemble dried up prunes because we haven't prayed and we're out of fellowship, we're out of sorts with our family, we're with the deacon board, we're not spirit filled. Paul here says, don't be drunk, don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And my point is this, apparently in God's sight, it's just as much a sin not to be controlled by the Spirit of God as it is to be controlled by wine. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with with the Spirit. So the bride is to be separated, to be serving, to be searching, to be spirit-filled, and to be singing. God loves for his people to sing, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God, and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be singing. Now, that's the responsibilities and the duties of the bride. What about the bridegroom? Well, he has his obligations and responsibilities also. And notice his devotion to the church here. His devotion is illustrated by marriage. Verses 22 23 and 24. Speak of this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So his devotion to the bride is illustrated uh, by marriage. Uh, there are twofold, there are two reasons given in the scripture for the first great divine institution. There's the institution, of course, of human government, the institution of the church, but the first institution was that of human marriage. And it came into being for two things. Number one, for reasons of propagation. God could have created human beings in a factory assembly line. He could have grown human beings by planting them in the earth as we grow corn. Uh, he could have created them out of thin air, but he chose this method of human propagation, the male and the female. This cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and God says to man and his wife, they were to replenish and to subdue and fill the earth after their kind. So one of the reasons for marriage was for reasons of propagation, and another was for reasons of illustration. God used the marriage relationship to illustrate the love that Christ had for his church. I have a boy who's nearly 15, and I love my son with all my heart. I honestly believe I would gladly lay down my life for my son 
as well I should. Uh, but you know, God did not say, fathers love your sons as Christ loved the church. I would have identified with that statement had he said it, but he didn't say that. Uh, some of you folks out there have uh, daughters, and you love those daughters, you mothers that are taking this course, you love those daughters every bit as much as I love my son. And God could have said, mothers love your daughters as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You could identify with that statement, but he didn't say that. What he did say was this, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That means, gentlemen, we ought to love our wives to the extent that we would be willing to lay down our life and die for them because that's what Christ did for his bride. So his devotion is illustrated by the marriage relationship, and then his devotion is demonstrated by the price that he paid on the cross. Verse 25, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and then his devotion will be consummated someday at the rapture, illustrated by the marriage. It is demonstrated on the cross. It will be consummated at the rapture, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The word spot here, of course, refers, I believe, to those imperfections from without as caused by the world, and the word wrinkle refers to those imperfections from within as caused by the flesh. These are very beautiful words indeed. The church is likened to a body, chapter 1, a temple, chapter 2, a mystery, chapter 3, a new man, chapter 4, a bride, chapter 5, and now a soldier, chapter 6. Uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee has written these words for us. The first part of this chapter, chapter 6, which opens with the instructions to children, parents, servants, and masters may seem foreign to the life of the soldier, but such is due to an oversight in giving prominence to the training of the soldier. A soldier's training, this is what this chapter is about, does not start in boot camp. It begins when he is a child in the home. And so that's where soldiers are made. And that's why Paul begins in the home by saying, Children, obey your parents. McGee goes on to say, The first lesson that a soldier must learn is obedience to those in authority. He must follow orders. The basic, this basic training is learned in the home. After the soldier has learned to obey, then he is in the position to be promoted to the rank of an officer, where he gives commands to others. To know how to give orders depends largely on how the soldier learned to obey. This basic training is found in the home with the parent-child relationship and the master-servant relationship. The victories of the Christian life are won in the home and in the place of business. Now notice uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, you have boot camp training. And then verses 10 to 24, you have front line fighting. And that brings us to the end of this chapter. All right, this boot camp training, Paul speaks about children and parents and about servants and masters. He says the child is to honor and obey his parents in the Lord. And the scripture says that the parent is to instruct and admonish his child. So the child is to honor the parent, and the parent is to instruct the child. Now concerning servants and masters, 
and this is a part of the boot camp training. Uh, my uh, position and my relationship with my employer will certainly determine my effectiveness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jerry Falwell is the easiest fellow on earth to get along with. If you can ever catch him, <laughs> that's the hardest point. Uh, I never thought that I could ever work for a man, though, that stood over me with a club and, and determined that uh, I had to be uh, at to work at a certain time and, and give a report every time I went out and get a cup of coffee or something. Uh, and I wondered whether I could uh, work for Jerry because I had been my own boss for 18 years in the pastorate, but I've not had that problem at all. In fact, it's the other extreme. I, when I came down here, his uh, attitude was, Harold, I'd like to reach the world for Christ, and if there's anything that you can do to help me, I'd sure appreciate it. From that point on, he's never uh, told me to do anything. He probably should have on occasions, but he's given me, he's given me a free hand to do those things that he felt God was wanting me to do. And I appreciate that so much, the freedom that we have here. But, but I know that my relationship as a soldier, my effectiveness, rather, as a soldier, would be severely curtailed uh, had I a wrong relationship with the boss, my employer, Jerry Falwell. So I read these verses, and I take them very seriously, Verses 5 to 9. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will during service, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. That's boot camp training. Now what about front line fighting? Verses 10 to 24. Paul summarizes by saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Notice now our enemy, and we do have an enemy, and this enemy is the devil. We wrestle not. Some Christians just put a period there and they don't. They don't do anything. But Paul says, look, gang, we've got a wrestling match. Oh, it's true, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our enemy, the devil. Now, let's notice our equipment. What is our equipment? Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What is our equipment? Uh, what Paul has done here, he's taken those pieces of armor uh, worn by the Roman soldier, and he makes spiritual application to each one. Notice he says, the girdle of truth. And this probably refers to truthfulness as found in the Christian. And thus, the believer whose life is tainted with deceit and falsehood, I think, forfeits the very thing which holds the other pieces of his armor together, which is the, the girdle here, this middle part that surrounded his, his, uh, his stomach and his chest. That speaks of truthfulness. And then we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness, a reference to the right acts as practiced by the believer. And then the sandals of the gospel, this may refer to the assurance and confidence which comes from knowing the great doctrinal truths associated with the gospel. And then we're to put on the shield of faith. Of course, we know what that is involved, uh, involves in this. Uh, and then the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. And finally, he says, I'm sorry, and the sword of the Spirit. And what I want to say finally about this is that this is the only offensive weapon uh, that we have. The rest are defensive, but we'll take the sword of the Spirit, and we know what that is, of course. That is the Word of God. Now, what are we to do after we dress ourselves in this armor of God? Paul says we are to stand, we are to pray, and we are to watch. Now, thus... 
he orders the soldier of God to do. I think of the words of songwriter B.H. Draper. I'm sorry. I think of the song uh, of the words uh, of the uh, song written by Isaac Watts, these words, Am I a soldier of the cross? Chapter 6 is about the soldier. And Watts writes about this soldier. He says, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to fight? Must I not stem the tide? Is this a vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? And then the final verse gives us the answer. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. The book of Ephesians, Paul's third heaven epistle. The church is likened to a body, to a temple, to a mystery, to a new man, to a bride, and to a soldier.